November marks the month of knowledge for SIDF. Knowledge management aims to ingrain knowledge sharing appetite to SIDF, SIDF's DNA, as well as promote knowledge sharing best practices within our organization culture and across NIDLIB entities. My name is Munir Bentenbeck. I'm from the Market Studies Department. I'm also a member of SIDF Integrated Mining Team. I'm very pleased to present the Aluminium Value Chain Workshop uh, presentation discussion today. It is a fantastic opportunity to shade light into the Aluminium Value Chain, overcome its obstacles, and mitigate its risks alongside the investment opportunity in the sector and especially important to this institution as a mining is promoted as the third pillar of investment within NIDLIB framework. Today, we are joined by a distinguished speakers and subject matter experts from CRU, Maadin, Ministry of Investment. Also, we are joined by our SIDF credit department to specifically detailed the financial support and advisory services provided by SIDF investors include the mining sector. The format will be 15 to 20 minutes presentation, followed immediately by Q&A if necessary for each entity. And now, please let me welcome our colleague Ayub Shaya from SIDF Relationship Management to introduce to us financial and non-financial services. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everybody. Uh, I'll give a quick uh, presentation about uh, SIDF and uh, its offerings. So uh, basically, SIDF was established in 1974 uh, with the aim uh, as a government financing uh, solution uh, with the aim to realize the objectives, policies, and programs uh, for the industrial uh, segment of Saudi Arabia. So SIDF mission is uh, to make Saudi Arabia as a global hub for uh, industry uh, and logistical sectors. Uh, this comes by realizing uh, the opportunities uh, Saudi Arabia can offer uh, by offering uh, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by offering uh, an attractive uh, financial solutions and non-financial solutions. Uh, part of these financial solutions uh, comes from the industry, uh, mining, energy, and logistic uh, sectors. So basically, SIDF can offer you uh, establishing uh, new projects, either uh, modernizing, uh, uh, relocating, or expanding uh, existing projects. Uh, for the mining segment itself, uh, SIDF can offer up to 75% financing. Uh, SIDF also uh, uh, offers the final stage of exploration. And uh, SIDF also uh, finance the supportive services uh, for the mining segment. Uh, uh, currently, SIDF offers a variety of financial products, which includes uh, project financing, medium to long term financing, uh, up to 20 years of uh, repayment. Uh, SIDF also uh, offers uh, working capital and supply chain financing, uh, short term financing up to 24 months. Also, SIDF offers uh, multi-purpose financing, which is up to five years of uh, repayment schedule. Uh, part of SIDF is to focus on digitalization. Uh, this is evidenced by uh, our, uh, our new uh, e-loan system and our land and loan uh, platform. So basically, you can apply to SIDF. Uh, you can communicate with SIDF without visiting, uh, without uh, submitting any hard documents. Everything can go uh, throughout uh, the portal. Uh, also, SIDF offers advisory services targeted for SME uh, projects. Uh, these services uh, tailored for cost optimization and, and penetrating the market. Uh, these, uh, these offers uh, can be extended uh, uh, to, to, again, to small and uh, medium uh, enterprises and uh, can be offered by three to four weeks uh, of due diligence. Uh, 
Uh, SIDF also uh, provides incentive packages uh, for, uh, for newcomers or existing uh, clients and, and renewable energy and local content for uh, SME enterprises and uh, for digitalization and energy efficiency. Uh, basically, uh, if, uh, if, if ex an existing client or a new client uh, wants to apply uh, to for, uh, for energy efficiency, uh, for example, Uh, basically, uh, if a client wants to apply for energy efficiency uh, or digitalization, uh, uh, SIDF uh, can 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 offer uh, financing up to up to seven five, seven years uh, for for these segments. Uh, for uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, SIDF uh, offer uh, collaboration programs with uh, KSU Prince Sultan uh, Development Fund and uh, an ex uh, ask an expert uh, in collaboration uh, with the Munja'at. For, uh, for local content, SIDF uh, is in collaboration with uh, uh, the private sector, uh, mainly Aramco, Sabic, uh, Ma'adan, uh, STC, and uh, SEC. Uh, SIDF can offer uh, financing uh, for uh, supply chain and localization opportunity uh, for, uh, for uh, projects that targeting to uh, uh, to sell to, to these uh, respective uh, private sector entities. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, SIDF uh, sector coverage uh, can, uh, can go to uh, uh, industry, mining, energy, and logistics. Uh, the term of the loan can go to uh, 20 years uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a grace period of, uh, of four years. Uh, uh, the financing uh, can go up to 10 billion uh, per applicor or three billion bear project, uh, the average approval uh, can go from four to five months from the start till the end. Uh, we can offer up to 75% financing. Uh, all, the, uh, all the process is automated. Uh, the pricing uh, is a fixed cost. It's not related to the market. And we can offer also advisory services. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, open for questions. Any uh, Sarat, Any questions? Thank you so much. Shukran, Ayub. Thank you. And now uh, it is my pleasure. And now it's my pleasure to introduce CRU Group, uh, a leading global authority providing business intelligence on the global metals mining and filterizer industry through a market analysis, price assessment, consultancy, and events. Please welcome both Mr. Paul Williams, head of aluminium, and Mr. Anthony Everest, alumina expert. They will be joining us from London virtually. Mr. Paul, can you hear us? Mr. Anthony, we can hear you. If you if you hear us, please pause for a little bit. We just have a little technical issue.
And then over on slide three, here's a, here's a snapshot of the, the aluminium team at, uh, at CRU, the, the largest aluminium analysis team uh, in, in, in the world. We, we, we cover the... Mr. Anthony, can I interrupt you for a second, please? Uh, you, we just received your voice, so can you please start over again? No problem. Can Thank you, you so much. Now it's clear. Excellent. Cheers. Excellent. Cheers. Apologies. Thanks. Apologies for that. No, it's apology from our yeah, side. I'll, I'll start again. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, thank you to the, the SIDF team for uh, inviting us to, to speak here today. It's, it's a pleasure to, to join you. Um, so we have two speakers from the aluminium team at, at the CRU here today. My name is uh, Anthony Everest. I'm an analyst in the aluminium team. I focus on aluminum and bauxite, which I will start off by talking about today. And I'm joined by by Paul Williams. Paul is head of, of aluminium at, at CRU. So I'm going to present first on the aluminum market, bauxite market, before I hand it over to Paul on the on the aluminium side. And we'll have plenty of time for, for questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so, so please just note the disclaimer over on slide two. Uh, and then on slide three, here's an overview of our aluminium team at, at CRU, the largest aluminium analysis team in the world. We, we cover um, the, the entire value chain. So, so Paul and myself, among others, are based in, in London. We have a strong presence in, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Mumbai. Our US team sent in, in Pittsburgh. And yes, if you aren't familiar with, with CRU, we offer business intelligence across the, the global metals mining and fertilizer industries. Okay, so we're going to go through the, the value chain. I'm going to start off with, with Illumina. So here's an <coughs> overview of my initial presentation. Um, so I'll start off with some recent developments, really to, to set the scene, uh, give a snapshot of the Illumina and Bauxite markets right now uh, in terms of prices, in terms of trade flows, uh, in terms of costs, looking at the structure of the market, what's the key drivers right now. Uh, then look at the output Illumina and then I'll very briefly touch on Bauxite and one of our, some, some of our expectations looking further ahead before I round off with some conclusions. Okay, so on the next slide, let me start off by showing you some of the typical alumina trade flows. So the largest producers of alumina in the world typically places like Australia and Brazil, where there are big refineries located close to integrated bauxite mines. And a lot of that alumina is exported to regions with a lot of aluminium production, like Russia, Canada, Europe, countries like Norway, and the Middle East, in particular Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. And alumina will typically be sold on a, on a spot or a longer term contract that will be linked to the alumina index price or, or older contracts that might be linked still to the aluminium price. Now some companies have looked to become more integrated upstream, so be less exposed to fluctuations or, or volatility in the alumina price. And we've seen that among some aluminium companies in, in the Middle East, in Asia, either building their own aluminium refinery or invested in existing assets in places like Australia and Indonesia. Uh, and another important development this year has been Australia uh, banning alumina exports to Russia since March this year. And now that has significantly changed alumina trade flows. It's made Russia look to places like Indonesia, for example. Indonesia and Vietnam have emerged as, as notable alumina producers. And, and finally, just note China. China is traditionally a net alumina importer of around three to four million tons per year. But China has the capability to also export significant amounts um, if required when there are drastic changes to the alumina market fundamentals. Okay, now if we, on the next slide, if we look specifically at alumina prices, here on slide six, on the left-hand side, you can see our major price indices for Australia and for Brazil. So the alumina price over the past few weeks, it's been quite underwhelming. It's traded close to the $310 per tonne. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have that spike at the end of Q1. Now that was when the resale refinery in Ukraine closed, and there was that uncertainty around the alumina trade flows. Well, after the Australian ban on, on shipments to Russia, the Pacific market has been well supplied. There's been good availability of alumina cargo. <coughs> that shaded uh, yellow area on the left shows the Atlantic alumina price premium. You see at times it was as high as $40 per tonne. It's, it's come off a bit recently, 
around $25 per tonne, and that reflects some cooling in the freight, uh, in the freight costs. Now, another factor is China not importing significant volumes, and in fact, exporting sizable volumes this year. So on the right-hand side, this shows the domestic Chinese aluminum price being consistently below those delivered Australian prices um, for a long period of, of this year. So there's been very little incentive for China to import aluminum. China's not been acting as that terminal, that, that last resort for unsold cargoes. And as you can see on the right-hand side, that Chinese price has been continually moving lower. It's been quite a long slog this year, very little upside for Chinese aluminum prices up until now. Now on the, on the next slide, you can see that the current situation is, uh, is very unsustainable from a cost point of view. Okay, so over on slide seven. Uh, as you can see here, this is prices quite close to the floor. We do these, uh, this is a snapshot from the quarterly cost dashboards we do at CRU. And this, this shows the extent that aluminum plants in, in Europe and China, they, they, have, they have been struggling. So in Q3, we estimate that about 40% of aluminum production was lost making. Now much of that is located in, in Europe, where gas prices have been very high. Some of this production is located in China. And as you can see, the aluminum prices now are also considerably below the 90th percentile. Now we've seen some aluminum contaminants announced. In, in Europe, there was a 50% cut at, at Alcoa San Cipion refinery in Spain back in July, August. There was a closure in, in Romania. But some of the other refineries, Stardane in Germany, all finished in Ireland, they would be at the very top of the cost curves were shown on the left-hand side. Um, now, on one hand, spot gas prices, yes, they, they, they have fallen from that very high and high-watered number at the end of September, but on one hand, that would markedly reduce the operating cost of these refineries, such as that it's likely they could continue operating at a much smaller rate of loss. But bear in mind that at CRU, we're forecasting very high natural gas prices in, in Europe for the next several years. So we, we really can't see any way for energy prices at these refineries to be low enough to continue operating at, at normal levels, unless they're able to perhaps hedge uh, low-class gas at the moment or, or convert to heavy fuel oil. But as a result, we've received additional aluminum contaminants. In Europe, we think average refinery utilization is going to be close to 50% in 2023. Now, on the next slide, if we look at uh, bauxite prices, now the typical benchmark price for bauxite is a, is a delivered China price. China is that dominant importer of bauxite, it's that dominant buyer of third party bauxite. Now there's been quite a strong recovery in recent months in bauxite prices. I mean those de delivered prices out of Guinea have been close to around $70 per tonne China SIF. These are, these are levels we haven't really seen since Guinea's been a, a major supplier to China. Now the factors driving this price were, well, well, yes, buoyant Chinese demand. That's often been the case with bauxite. Um, but, but now, in, in, in terms of being the norm for China to import about 10 million tonnes per month of, of bauxite, Guinea dominating that basket of imports. And those with aluminum plants in China have been ramping up, being more dependent on imports out of Guinea. We've also been moving, I should say, out of the wet season in, in Guinea as well. But sentiment's also been buoyed by, by Indonesia. Um, he was there about an export ban. Many ministers in Indonesia have said that that's, that will happen at, at some point this year, that we only have you know, four, four to five weeks left of the year now. I don't think there's any doubt that there's always alternatives available in bauxite. Maybe just the risk of some short-term additional costs or delays in having to source the bauxite um, from elsewhere away from Indonesia. Okay, so now on, on slide uh, nine, the next slide, in terms of uh, looking further ahead uh, and our overview of aluminum demand growth. So well, this depends directly on CRU's view on, on aluminium production. So I won't go into detail here as, as, as Paul will be, will be covering out of it shortly, but just in terms of the aluminum perspective, the aluminum demand contracting outside of China this year, we've seen a significant smelter contaminants in, in Europe, um, more recently disruption at Moselle, uh, now that, that takes um, South Africa's alumina from, from Australia, and Chinese aluminum demand growing this year by, by 4%, but that uncertainty in Southeast China, 
from the disruptions we've seen in, in Citroën and, and Yunnan. But I, I would say that there's long-term demand prospects for Illumina. They're still you know, quite, quite strong, and, and, and China, in China, those promoters that will continue to accelerate the use of, of green uh, energy. But short-term, certainly those disruptions on Illumina uh, demand. But I'll focus on the Illumina supply and on, on the next uh, slides. I think that what's important to know when it comes to looking further ahead is that there are some big Illumina projects that are coming on stream that will keep the market reasonably well supplied. Um, so listed here on this, on this slide, but these are some of the main brownfield and greenfield expansions um, we expect to come on stream over the next five years. If I just pick out a couple of the, of the ones here that, that stand out, um, Chongqing Jilong and, and Inner Mongolia Chifeng, these are, these are very, very big projects in China. That Inner Mongolia one, in fact, has a final um, proposed capacity of over 6 million tonnes. So we're just showing the, the first phase here. But really, as you can see, a lot of the ones in China coming will be using imported bauxite. Uh, an aluminum project is expected to come in Guangxi in southwest China. So more aluminum we find is being built in the southwest uh, after the smelters have, have moved to the, the southwest to use uh, the hydropower. There's a few in, in Indonesia here that I, I would say that the development of the refineries in Indonesia has been, has been quite slow. But we have seen the second phase of, of Bintan that has happened this year. Um, in India, there are further expansions at, at Lanshigar. Now, that's going to be important in reducing Vedanta's dependency on third-party aluminum. Um, and we've seen further gains uh, among other producers in, in, in India. Utkow is, is in Delta, we find also uh, doing further expansion work. But overall, as you can see, there are some large projects in the pipeline. Um, and so on the next slide, if you, if you just... Uh, in terms of what that means in, in the Illumina supply over the next five years, it is, it is growing strongly. So, so metric grade Illumina supply, that, that MGA we're showing here, that's Illumina that goes towards the aluminium industry. We see it reaching close to 148 million tonnes by, by 2027. That's compared to 131 million tonnes in 2021. So those are those committed refinery projects in Asia really driving this growth. Um, Several of which in China or Indonesia are already you know, under construction or already in the process of, of ramping up at the end of this year. We are factoring in additional growth in aluminum supply in the Middle East region here. Um, not, not as large as those, those regions I've just uh, discussed, but there are those expansion plans being discussed in, in, in Iran, a potential doubling of aluminum capacity as well, eventually at, at Al Tarila in the UAE. Okay. But on the next slide, in terms of what that means in terms of our alumina price forecast, uh, you know, generally alumina has been fairly well supplied recently, keeping alumina somewhat underwhelming relative to, to aluminium. So more recently, around 13.4% of the metal price. As you can see, that's somewhere below that historical norm, which has been closer to 17%. Uh, so that's, that's very underwhelming near term. Now, we do expect the refinery curtailments to drive the, the price higher. Um, our aluminum price forecast of next year around $330 per tonne. Now that's starting from a very low level at the moment, around $310, but climbing over the course of the year, averaging around $350 in Q4. So we've assumed those additional cuts in Europe, albeit some of the producers, they're happy quite coy in, in announcing the channel coming, but we see that eventually driving at that price higher and more broadly balanced market, and there is that, that significant cost escalation at the moment to consider. We have an upside scenario with Illumina lifting potentially to, to 400. That, that, those risks certainly skew towards the uh, towards that level from a cost point of view. If we see additional closure announcements uh, in China as well, there's always that uncertainty around this time of the year with our uh, winter supply uh, risk. But the downside uh, risk largely stems from amount of demand. You know, if we were to see that greater than expected demand destruction. Okay, now on the, on the next slide, uh, slide 13, we look at some of the major market participants in terms of their exposure to third-party alumina, the next long, short position of each in 2021. Now, I won't, I won't go through each one here, but if we look at the companies that are known to be in alumina short position um, last year, it's those on the right-hand side here. With, uh, for, for those companies, upstream investments can be increasingly attractive during times of price volatility. Some companies have, have opted to try and build a new aluminum refinery. 
Now, that's not to say that every company uh, in, in a short position here can simply just, just build a greenfield refinery. This isn't an, an easy thing to do. Um, but buyers can, can also invest in a, an equity stake in an existing asset. Um, I think Fresh Metal is a good example here. You know, having acquired access to aluminum supply, supply from, from Worsley, as well as acquiring an interest in, in Indonesia as well. But exposure to the aluminum index has provided contrasting fortunes to the companies listed here by becoming that desire to become increasingly self-sufficient. Okay, now, now in the interest of time, on the next slide, I won't go into to too much detail here, but I think it's, it's important to know about that decarbonisation challenge facing the Lumina, certainly over the longer term horizon. So if we're, we're talking about China and its aspiration for, for carbon neutrality by, by 2060. Now there is that, that potential to constrain additional refining capacity in China beyond what's already been approved or, or is already under construction. Now, um, only in China there is quite a strong recovery in aluminum production. I've like mentioned those big projects that are coming on stream. But after this uh, medium term horizon, we, we do see that production growth being more muted, uh, prior to eventually peaking around the end of, of this decade. There are a few opportunities for Chinese refineries to, to, to decarbonize, apart from you know, switches to gas that encompasses availability and cost difficulties. There are those environmental issues to consider around bauxite uh, residue concerns. Now that might lead to Chinese aluminum growth being uh, restricted to investments outside China. Um, and that's where we see a lot of activity happening, trying to invest in, in places like Indonesia, potentially Guinea in the future. And also on the aluminum side, important to note, to note some of the developments happening to lower the carbon footprint elsewhere. That's been particularly evident in Australia, but several of these developments likely to also uh, take, take time. Okay, now, now turning to bauxite on the next uh, slide. Here, you, you can see here how those bauxite market dynamics really do continue to change. Okay, so China needs to import more and more bauxite. The location of securing that bauxite right now is firmly entrenched in Guinea, to a lesser extent Australia. I think one point I would always emphasise and to remember with bauxite is that there are always those significant resources and, and reserves across the world but gaining access to those reserves is, is not easy. There, there are environmental restrictions, there are government restrictions. Um, and so we've seen how China has turned from, uh, from Indonesia to, to Malaysia uh, to, to Guinea as its main source for bauxite. And I think Guinea certainly looks set to be that long-term supplier to China. It has that vast quantity of reserves and resources. It has that historical presence in bauxite. Bauxite mining has been important to the country's GDP. Um, but it's going to be a period of transition in Guinea following the military coup last September. That stable environment is going to be key for investors. But over the, the long term, you can see here, by the end of our five-year outlook, 2027, imports are around 62% of, of total Chinese demand, and, and, and imports from Guinea are growing proportion of that share. Right. Um, now, on the, on, the, on the next slide, just to give an overview of, of China's uh, issue, I guess, with, with bauxite is that, is that deterioration in bauxite reserves and resources. This is, this is both from a quantity and quality point of view. So that bauxite grade in China, we, use, we, we, we typically measure that in terms of its alumina silica content, so the higher the alumina silica ratio, the better. And as you can see on the left-hand side, that's been deteriorating. So China's been running out of good quality bauxite, there's been examples of, of more underground mining, for example, in places like Henan, uh, more, more high, high cost. And bauxite supply, as you can see on the right-hand side, it's already really plateaued in China. In fact, it did you know, three, three, four years ago. So it's remaining below those levels now. We've seen that closure of some of the smaller merchant mines because of environmental restrictions. Um, just another caution that analysts have, have probably been predicting that China's going to run out of bauxite for for, uh, for many, many years now, and in fact, you know, more reserves have continued to be, to be discovered. But I think, nevertheless, we, we can see that the decline in the, the quality of the bauxite, and that growing uh, dependence on imports has, has really become inevitable. Okay, now my last uh, slide uh, before I wrap up uh, is, on, is on Guinea, and, and I think just to, to note some of the major opportunities and threats when it comes to, to Guinea. Because Guinea, we see, is that vital long-term bauxite supply to China. Um, 
uh, come from a quality report, you're ready the market that signed big quality, 46% of the content, below 2% of the Pacifica, that growth in consumption in, in, in China makes that, you know, having high quality gives that book site very important. Um, they have quite a competitive cost position. They've been somewhat adversely affected by the increase in fuel prices because of their, their, their dependency on, on trans shipping. But uh, yeah, as I mentioned, half the amount of reserves and resources, and there, there are typically Chinese associated projects that, that uh, utilize these. Uh, but just a comment on resource nationalism in, in, in Guinea, I think there's, there is that ongoing threat there. The, the, the ruling junta there had, had declared that mining companies provide a blueprint to build alumina refineries there, rather than just exporting the bauxite. Now that's a, a logical target, but it's very difficult to achieve in Guinea. Um, there are hurdles to overcome. You don't really have the energy requirement to easily just 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 do this. Um, and in terms of those, I have not yet covered on this slide. Well, we're on the ESG side. I think that's you know, of course becoming an increasingly important topic. There's been a lot of prominent articles in places like um, Human Rights Watch in, in the Economist, you know, focusing on mining in Guinea and whether it's being carried out in a sustainable. Way. So it's that, that sense of this honeymoon period coming to an end in Guinea, where this will be under more stringent measures. Okay, so I'm going to just round off with some conclusions now on the final slide. Uh, so aluminum prices are very underwhelming over the past quarter. There's been good availability of alumina. We've seen those woes on the alumina demand side, but they're not far away from the floor now. Um, that theme right in the third party market of buyers over the past few years becoming increasingly integrated upstream, um, whether we're talking in the, the GTC region or, or in, in Asia as well, in, in Southeast Asia. Current aluminum prices are unsustainable from a cost point of view. We do see additional curtailments happening on alumina, and that will eventually allow the API and the alumina price to also move, move higher. On the box side, there's very buoyant Chinese demand. Uh, China becoming more dependent on imports. Uh, yes, supply, bauxite supply is increasing strongly, as has been the case in Guinea for some time now, really dominating that China's uh, basket of imports. Okay, so that's it from, from, from me to, to discuss off. Thank you for listening to my, my, presentation, uh, my presentation today. Happy to answer questions after the next session, and I'll hand over to Paul now on the aluminium side. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Anthony, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the aluminium market, its short-term headwinds, but positive long-term prospects. So uh, we are in a bit of a short-term crisis in terms of the market, and uh, especially in Europe, um, but the long-term prospects remain very positive for the industry. So I'll look at the economic and demand outlook, uh, then uh, look at production, and also, uh, as Anthony has done, uh, look at some of the issues in China, some of its industry developments and decarbonisation trends. An important factor there also is its exports of semi-fabricated products or fabricated products. It isn't an export of primary aluminium, but it does export semis. And look at some of the uh, outlooks for price in the short and medium term. So we are seeing a sharp slowdown in economic growth globally. Uh, I think there's a number of factors behind that. The energy crisis, of course, which has uh, gripped Europe especially, but also there's global supply chain issues. And both of these have fueled inflation. So inflation at, at the multi-decade highs in many countries. This is, of course, leading to uh, tightening monetary policy, increasing interest rates across the world. And also, of course, we have the war in Europe, Ukraine, which has also had economic impacts and uh, leading to sharp slowdowns in Europe. The US, I think, is coming into a slower a period of growth as its in, in, in interest rates have increased, and Asia has also seen slow, slower growth as well. Uh, so it's a difficult situation outside China, and China is also having its own economic difficulties. Uh, its property market has been exceptionally weak, and the bubble has burst, if you like, in the property market and drive economic growth much lower, well below its previous 6% target. If you can look at the GDP chart on the left. Uh, and the other factor behind slow growth in China is, of course, its zero uh, tolerance on COVID, which has led to some significant further lockdowns in 2022, especially in uh, populous areas of Beijing, Shanghai, etc. 
This has had a, a detrimental impact on economic activity. That is continuing. There's some hints and some developments that suggest that the policy is easing, but as we, as we see, there's still a lot of um, restrictions in China on movement of people. 2024-27, uh, we should see the sixth turn and the more normal return to growth, uh, and that's positive, of course, in the longer term. But at the moment, as you can see, both on GDP and industrial production levels are very weak going into 2023. However, the medium term growth prospects for aluminium, and here we're looking at semi fabricated products, is, is still very positive, it's even with the uh, difficult 2022 and 2023 that we see, uh, we see we'll see compound annual growth rates globally outside of China of almost 4% per annum, 3.8 we have here. And you can see the growth across the, the key regions and then the growth in the key market sectors. And we see good growth in all the major sectors, maybe construction less so, certainly in the next couple of years. Uh, but there's, there's certainly positive developments from the green transition and the energy transition in the, in the global economy. So packaging is very strong trends for aluminium, especially in beverage cans, and I'll talk about that in a second. Foil is another uh, uh, product showing very strong growth trends, again because of packaging, but also now other applications, technical applications, and especially I think we're going to see uh, uh, some very sharp growth in uh, battery foil uh, as uh, both in electric vehicles, but also a storage when you increase um, uh, power generated from solar or wind, for example. So automotive uh, would certainly recover from current slumps, and it's very positive for aluminium demand as well, as we'll see in a couple of slides later. And also that transition from the combustion engine to the electric vehicle is another driver because of the, the, what it means for aluminium intensity of the vehicle. And as I said, energy transition supports supporting demand from renewable power growth and solar and wind. I mentioned one application, the battery pod. The other application, of course, power cables and, and uh, putting that uh, power onto the grid, etc. So this is uh, a very long-term trend forecast for beverage can sheet consumption. And this certainly has very strong prospects, we're going to reach a market close to 10 million, um, forecast is 9.8 million right at the start of the next decade, uh, compared to um, 6.8 million uh, at the start of this decade. So that's quite a very strong growth, very strong across all the regions as well. And there's some key key global trends uh, that uh, enacted here. Yeah, there's the continued per capita growth in developing regions, uh, it's continued per capita growth in even saturated, what we thought saturated markets like North America or US. And we're seeing more beverages packaged in cans, including waters, uh, mixer drinks, seltzers, uh, as well as your traditional uh, beer or, or carbonated soft drinks. But then you have the shift in the packaging mix as well, supporting aluminium demand. Shift from glass uh, uh, to cans in beer, and also, of course, we in recent years to have the backlash against the plastics and plastic packaging and there's a shift from PET to cans and carbonated soft drinks. Short term headwinds definitely at the moment uh, as inflation is biting into consumer spending and of course the price of the final beverage uh, packaged in cans uh, but the long term trends remain positive. And it's also positive in the, the, the Gulf region, country demand has, still has good medium term prospects uh, across the Middle East. Um, sugar taxes has had some slight growth in recent years and there's been a weak Turkish economy. Uh, but it's still very good longer term growth prospects and uh, Kingdom Saudi Arabia has a very strong can making sector and includes the export of beverage can, uh, end, sorry, beverage end. So it's a very strong area for the market and we see good growth in, across other parts of the GCC over the medium term. I think I mentioned another area that it will support the growth of aluminium demand long term is basically the, what we call the electrification of the vehicle sector and that's the growth of new energy vehicles, what we call, you can see here the, 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 the acronyms BEV, PHEV, that's the, that's the battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. ICE is the internal combustion engine. Uh, the traditional car, uh, but you can see that shift globally 
that's taking place at the moment slowly away from the ICE towards the BEV, the PHEV, or the hybrid electric vehicle as well. And that will, that pace of change will accelerate through this decade into the next decade. We're already seeing very fast pace of change in China, at some extent in Europe, and beginning also in North America as that shifts away from the ICE to battery electric or plug-in, certainly battery electric in the main. What does that mean? Well, it means it's pretty good for aluminium demand because we see higher intensity in the battery electric vehicle or plug-in hybrid. You can see the numbers here in total for each of the types of aluminium, whether it's rolls, extrusions, etc. You can see the traditional ICE at 164 compared to a battery electric at 227. And there's also a different mix within the product form. So more roll product, whether that's all the body sheet or the battery foil, for example, more extrusions with battery casings, etc. In fact, the only area where you're going to see aluminium lose out in this shift is in secondary casting because, of course, secondary castings are the engine blocks and the other engine parts. Increasingly, of course, we won't need those parts in cars at the shift to battery electric. So it's a very positive development generally for aluminium demand. However, at the moment, we are seeing a fall in demand through demand destruction from inflation, especially if this is the chart showing the world outside of China and the quarterly growth rates. And we are seeing particularly weak at the moment and into Q1 before things improve again through the second half of next year. So the full year growth this year, it's very moderate, 0.2, a little bit better next year before we then see an acceleration of demand again. And the weak demand does reflect the weakness in Europe, especially, particularly in building construction markets and other industrial products where it's really been hit by the rise in inflation and the rise in energy prices in particular. I think in North America, we'll see slowing in some sectors over the next few months as interest rates begin to bite, the rise in interest rates bite. But as I said, in some markets and other product forms, things are still okay and resilient. As I mentioned, cans and foil and packaging in general remains a resilient market. But certainly some short-term pain for the industry to bear before things improve. So I haven't mentioned China yet too much. And what we're seeing in China is also very weak growth, as this slide shows on the consumption side. Very moderate growth in 2022 and maybe a bit better next year, closer to 2%. And again, it's the property sector that's really weak in China. And the property market or demand from the construction sector is its largest end-use sector. So when that suffers, it's very difficult to get meaningful growth. And I think that's the real pain in China at the moment, coupled with the impacts of the lockdowns which stifle consumer spending. At the same time, on the production side, production has improved, primary production, that is, has improved this year in China. It suffered last year from the closure of capacity due to power shortages, and that failed to ramp up new capacity. We are seeing that happen this year, to get a full year growth of 4%. But even now, at the moment, production is beginning to suffer a little bit, again, from power shortages. And the power shortages really come from Yunnan province in particular, where the hybrid power is, and lack of rainfall in particular is impacting power generation. And the first sector that is asked to cut production as a result of that is the one of the first is aluminium. And we are seeing slower growth, as you can see, going into early 23 in terms of production. Now, another factor on the industry at the moment is the, on the primary aluminium side, is the large scale closures that we've seen in, well, over the last 12 months, really, uh, the end, from the end of last year uh, up until very recently. Um, 
has been massive closures of primary capacity in Europe. Uh, there's been some closures in, in the US, uh, at Century Aluminum, but the epicenter of this loss of primary capacity uh, outside of China is in Europe and the uh, EU, I should say, and it's really caused by that massive rise in energy prices. Now, the increase in energy prices started before the war in Ukraine. It obviously accelerated further, uh, and capacity was closing even when prices were uh, well above $2,500 a ton uh, and $2,600 a ton. Even at those sort of prices, many of these smelters in the EU, in northern, northern, northern Europe, uh, and, and uh, Eastern Europe and Spain, simply could not uh, uh, compete or operate profitably, uh, profitably because of the massive rise and escalation they suffered in power costs. So the European Union has lost 46% of its operating capacity this year. And uh, not surprisingly, there's been little growth in production this year. In fact, that we see a moderate 0.1% decline for the year uh, with further, some further production problems, as Anthony mentioned, at Mozal more recently and very little growth in 2023. Just some perspective on where we are, the world ex-China smelter production is around 22.7 million tonnes in 2022. And, and this chart just shows how important the GCC region is and how important uh, uh, Kingdom, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is also to the, the global production of primary aluminium. But of course, we have it across the whole of the GCC. It's the largest group, if you like, uh, in, in terms of the uh, proportion of production outside of China. Uh, Russia is also another key producing region along with North America, although that's mostly Canada. <laughs> India has emerged as a significant producer more recently. Uh, I want to watch would be Indonesia going forward. Uh, uh, we are seeing the capacity now coming uh, on in, in Indonesia and from Chinese producers as well. So China, one factor goes that Chinese Chinese producers are looking to invest in Indonesia more uh, because of their, their lack of investment opportunities in, in China. Um, in terms of emissions, we look at the, the, the CO2 emissions per ton of aluminium produced in terms of scope one and two, and GCC starts to sit in the middle of an emissions curve. Um, not, not as good as renewables, of course, in terms of renewable power, uh, but of course far better than what we see from coal-fired power. Uh, and the, the emissions uh, that occur are from aluminium produced from power that's generated from coal, which is around the 16 ton level. <coughs> and one thing to watch, uh, I, I, I always say, um, on the market and how the ex-China market will fare is also how much China is able to export in terms of its semi-fabricated products and also fabricated products such as aluminium structures, which has a trade code of 7, 6, 10. Uh, and also foil is another important export area. The more it exports of those products, the more it fuels its own primary demand at the expense of primary demand outside of China. Uh, and that has been a key feature for well, at least a decade. And as you can see, 2021, 22 from this chart on the left, the, the growth in exports has been very strong. Uh, and in fact, over the first half of this year, they were exceptionally strong, which was another factor uh, containing primary demand growth outside of, uh, outside of China. The uh, last few months, I think that growth has stalled quite sharply. Uh, obviously, demand outside of China has fallen, and therefore, Chinese exports of semis, etc., will fall as well. Uh, we're also seeing more of the impact of anti-dumping duties, particularly in Europe. They've been placed or reimposed in Europe. They have been withdrawn, which led to a massive increase in exports from China to the European Union. They've now been reimposed and we're seeing a big fall again of, of sheet exports to, to Europe. Uh, and I think next year we could see a very difficult year for Chinese ex exports, uh, as it also fixes and more anti-dumping in foil as well. Uh, well, the chart on the right shows where its exports are really strong, and that's in Kanshi, beverage Kanshi. And you can see some of the growth rates that they've achieved in their exports over the, over the year to September across some key regions, uh, where Mexico is a standout market for, for Chinese Kanshi. Um, 
and the European Union has emerged as a, as a more significant market in recent, or well, just this year really, as you can see, very little going in in 2021, massive increases in 2022. I suspect that could lead to uh, further uh, questioning from European producers and whether, uh, uh, they, uh, and whether governments of the EU will launch further uh, investigations on, on an anti-dumping basis. One of the key questions we've always asked is, will China keep its 45 million ton per year primary aluminium capacity cap which it imposed in 2017? And I think this question is always asked because if you look at the history of the aluminium industry, certainly since the end, the end of last century into this century, uh, China has obviously over, overproduced in terms of its capacity which has led to um, a, a downturn in markets as a result. It also helps fuel its exports in semis because the, 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 its primary aluminium has to be, capacity has to be used in some way or another, and if it's not domestically used, uh, it looks for exports, of course, of semi-fabricated products. Uh, but it has now imposed this capacity cap, uh, which we're getting very close to in the next couple of years in terms of that cap. And I think it will retain that cap as it looks to decarbonize its, uh, its economy, uh, its set the goals, the uh, 30, 60 goals, that's 2030 carbon peak, 2060 carbon neutral, it's looking increasingly to increase the proportion of renewable power uh, within its, its um, power mix for smelters, and it has increased to 27.5%. As I mentioned, Yunnan is now a very big area for capacity, almost 5 million tons, just in Union, it is hydropower. They're looking to get to 33% 33 by 2030 as well in terms of renewable power for its aluminium smelters. Having said that, it's got a long way to go on decarbonisation because coal will still be two thirds of its power requirement by 2030. So that's still quite significant. But it has significantly increased its proportion of renewable power in the last few years. And the other reason it wants to stick to its primary uh, target or capacity target of 45 million and not exceed that is also now also wants to increase its use of recycled metal uh, and putting the cap on primary will also encourage the growth of the circular economy, the growth of secondary aluminium production and the chart on the left or the bottom left shows we do see a significant growth in, in recycled consumption uh, in China over the next few years. It's putting in a lot of capacity to recycle uh, post-consumer scrap now in China, both UVC but also the, 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 the scrapping of buildings, etc. will come back into the market, cars uh, and durables. There's now a pool of, uh, that will emerge in terms of scrap and we'll need to uh, use that and make it as a resource, increase its uh, recycled aluminium usage as a proportion of the metal requirement. So if you look at uh, other markets like North America, it's metal requiring maybe 50% primary aluminium, 50% secondary aluminium or recycled and, and similar proportions or 60-40 proportions in Europe and other regions. In China it's still more like 80-20. So even getting aluminium recycled consumption usage up to 27% will be a challenge but it's something that will need to happen in China as part of its decarbonisation program. And second, keeping that cap really is uh, one of the ways it has to try and achieve that target. I won't go very quickly, this is just the balances for next year. I think the key point is that although we're now in a market that's in surplus, and we've moved from a deficit in the first half of this year into a surplus the second half of this year, the surplus is a pretty moderate, uh, certainly by historical standards. Uh, even next year, outside of China, surplus 140,000 tons. It's not that, it's significant, but not that significant, especially on the stocks to consumption ratio. So we're not seeing this huge growth of a surplus or a burgeoning surplus. And the key factor there is, as I've mentioned, that there was, we've lost a million tons, over a million tons of capacity just in Europe this year, uh, in the EU. So that, that there's not that supply response, and, and there's not that much supply still to close. Uh, so 
that is a reason why the, pack, the, the services will not sort of get out of hand, if you like, and require, there might even be some more closures outside, uh, in Europe, because of its high cost. So we don't see a massive surplus developing, certainly outside of China, outside of China. Whereas we see stock levels remain relatively low compared to where they were back in 2020. Those are just the LME stock levels there. So in terms of price, um, I think you can see what's happened on the market this year quite, quite extraordinary, really, really, in terms of where we saw prices at the start of this year, uh, I don't, average of close to 3,300 in the first quarter of 2022. I think what, what we saw there was the impact of those closures in Europe, demand was still good in the early part of this year, and the, the key thing on people's mind at that time was the war in Ukraine and whether Russian supply, Russia supply, you know, produces 4 million tons of primary aluminium. What's going to happen to that supply? Will it be sanctioned? Will it be banned, etc.? Uh, as it turned out, Russian metal continues to supply the market. Uh, demand has begun to ease, as I said, and you can see the impact on price. And prices have fallen quite dramatically the last few quarters. We still see some softness in price going into the first quarter of 2023. Having said that, prices are a little higher than we expected. They're still around 2,400. So there's still some upside on our 2023 forecast, which is of uh, around 2,170. Uh, but the key point here is that going into the next few years, the price will recover quite strongly, in our view, uh, because, as I said, stock to consumption ratio remain relatively low, even in this downturn. So when demand starts to improve, the market will begin to tighten quite significantly, prices will need to rise to incentivize the capacity to come on stream that's planned over the next few years, or uh, uh, even at these prices, very little European capacity will come on, maybe a little bit towards the end of this period, uh, including in Spain, but uh, even at these prices, we saw a few, uh, last year that uh, smelters were not profitable even at some of the prices we forecast over the next few years. So. I think it's still a positive long-term trend on prices through 25, 26, 27. 2023 20, 20, will be the bottom of this particular cycle. So just look at some uh, takeaways for you. There. So yes, the economic growth is faltering. Uh, demand has weakened. But as I say, stocks remain relatively low. That stocks to consumption ratio. Uh, we're in a surplus, it's a moderate surplus, especially outside of China, and the long-term demand prospects remain strong. There's escalating uh, smelting costs, uh, combined with the lower prices where we've seen that continue to shut capacity in Europe this year. Prices are likely to fall further from where they are, but we expect prices to start to sustain recovery from mid-2023. The other the factors in the market that you know, could change, you know, any forecast, is that still question of Russian metal supply. Uh, there's not going to be any LME ban, but could governments start sanctioning more on Russian supply? We don't know. They haven't up to yet, yet, but we don't know how things could worsen in terms of geopolitical uh, risk on that side. And as I said, the cyclical downturn in demand will swing around the medium long term demand prospects of growth and price will recover over the medium term as well. So thank you for your attention and both myself and Anthony happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much Mr. Paul William for this informative presentation. And now we would like to take some questions from our side here. So Mr. Yad. Thank you so much. I have a couple of questions for Anthony about uh, refining of uh, bauxite. So how much is the energy as a component of total cost of refining bauxite to Almuna? And second question, does it make sense for Saudi to shift to imported raw material bauxite rather than continuing with their own locally produced bauxite? As you mentioned, UAE is refining imported uh, African bauxite. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the, thank you for the question. Um, 
I think well, energy is a, is a significant proportion of the of the site cost for an alumina refinery, and the biggest proportion is is typically bauxite bauxite cost. I think that's uh, that, that dominates a proportion of the site cost curve. Um, during this period, I can find the exact number because I don't know off the top of my head how much energy is of a of a of a, of a, uh, of a refinery cost. Uh, I believe it's around um, 30 to 35 percent of alumina's total cost. Um, but during this Q&A, I, I would double check that figure is 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 correct. Um, but as I say, I think it's the second largest cost component after the bauxite cost. Then is is is, is energy, and then after that you have you know caustic soda is, is a smaller proportion, about 10 percent or so. But yes. All part number, I would say 30 to 35 percent, but I will, I will double check that during this Q and A. Um, on the on the second part of the uh, question on um, <coughs> on the on the Altaria refinery and source in force, that, that, well, that is correct. I think there are there are long long term contracts in place to to allow for that. It really depends on the on the volume of, of nearby bauxite reserves that are available, and and when there is a nearby bauxite, then the option is is needed to to, to import. Um, I think what helps, although Guinea is, you know, it's quite a long way to move that bulk site from, from West Africa to, to, to the Middle East, I think what helps now is being able to move, you know, Cape Sides vessels out of Guinea significantly brings down the, 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 the unit cost. But uh, yes, I would, I would uh, imagine it to be still coming from, from Guinea, and that would be from long term contracts from, with, with CBG, for example, that have now operated a bulk site mine in Guinea. Um, EGA does also have its own bulk site mine uh, in, in Guinea. Uh, it's a big bulk site mine, it's about 12 million tons capacity. But I think a lot of that is still being sold in a third party market. So we still expect the, the long term contracts in place for CBG to be providing bulk sites um, to, to, that, to that refinery. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, regarding the methodology of pricing of alumina, uh, you talked about the index and also we talked about percentage of LME. Uh, why is there a difference between both of them? Yani, uh, I remember before five years there was something like unifying the pri uh, pricing of alumina either by index or uh, percentage of LME. Yes, so around uh, 11, 12 years ago, probably around 2010, 2011, there was a strong adoption of, of index-based pricing in alumina. Now, the concept of index-based pricing is to allow alumina to respond to its own market fundamentals. So when there's a change in that supply-demand balance for alumina, when there's a change in the cost position, position for alumina, then the alumina price responds accordingly. Because traditionally, before then, alumina was priced um, as a percentage of, of the metal price, so it wasn't responding to its own market fundamentals. But, so there was quite a strong drive um, as I say, around 11, 12 years ago, for, for contracts to be linked to, to an index-based based price um, to respond to its own, its own market fundamentals. I think we've, we've seen the effect that that has had on the market. In, in 2015, 2016, it was a, was a, was a very low alumina uh, index price at times, a, a lot of supply in the market. We saw what happened in 2018 when there was a big disruption in Brazil, the Alonorte refinery. Um, had to close by 50%. That was a big impact on the aluminium value chain, and as a result, the alumina index price did, did move significantly higher. So the concept of index-based pricing is the idea is to allow alumina to respond to its own underlying market fundamentals. Um, I think there's a, a big drive among producers to, to, to push for that index uh, around that time. And as we've seen, long-term contracts expire. These have been replaced. Um, that they were mentioning these have been replaced by index lead contracts. I think a company like Alcoa now is about 95% index lead, so quite heavily entrenched in their in their uh, in, 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 in their pricing now. I think what, what it relies on is is a, is a composite price among three of the major price reporting agencies. So CIU is, is one of those one of those three. Our methodology does slightly differ from the other two in that we are transaction only based. Uh, transaction only based index. Uh, we, we believe that provides important transparency around the calculation of the index, um, albeit it does rely on, on liquidity in, 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 in the market. But uh, yeah, the, the idea, the, the real concept is, is to allow an aluminum price that responds to its own fundamentals and not just flex the, the aluminium price. 
I would just say the aluminium price is still, is still important. Uh, 90% or 95% of aluminium goes to the metal at the end of the day. So when, uh, you know, when Paul said that aluminium might be, you know, is coming down in a few months next year, that, that is important for alumina. But there are those other uh, uh, factors of the market to consider. Uh, as, as I said, you know, aluminium closures that can impact the market. So there's more to it than just the, the aluminium uh, price. So that's, that, that's in a nutshell of the concept of, of index based pricing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, uh, CRU Group, for this informative uh, presentation. And uh, now we would like to, uh, uh, we're very uh, fortunate enough to be uh, joined by the uh, Saudi Arabian mining company, Maadin. Uh, Maadin is the largest multiple uh, commodity mining metals company in the Middle East uh, and among the fastest growing uh, mining companies in the world. They operate 70 mines and sites, have 6,000 direct and indirect employees, and export product to over 30 countries. So joining us from Maadin today is Mr. Abdelaziz Zbeib, Operational Excellency Maadin Aluminium Company. So welcome, Mr. Abdelaziz. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And ladies and gentlemen, let me, first of all, I would like to thank this IDF for hosting us as a Ma'adan to introduce our company and the value chain of aluminium industry. Before I start, uh, I would like to start with something different rather than only a presentation. I would like to introduce Ras Al Khair as an industrial city and aluminium business as well in a small video and bear, us, bear, bear with us, please. Then we are going to uh, throw the presentation. The epicenter of the Saudi mining industry, built by Mahadin and several government stakeholders. The Ras Al Khair Industrial City is located approximately 60 kilometers northwest of Jubail Industrial City and is a major global metals and mineral city with integrated industrial complexes that leverage the key mineral resources and competitive advantages of Saudi Arabia. Ras Al Khair is a world-class multi-commodity industrial manufacturing city that some industry analysts have described as one of the most ambitious single-faced industrial projects ever conceived globally. Ras Al Khair is the center point of the Saudi mining industry value chain that extends to the north of Saudi Arabia, where phosphate mineral reserves, amounting to 7% of the global total reserves, are located, and to the center of Saudi Arabia, where massive oxide mineral reserves have been discovered. Both phosphate and bauxite are extracted and processed at the mines before being transported to Ras Al Khair on a dedicated 1,450 kilometers mineral rail network, the same distance between London to Rome. This vast industrial railway facilitates the connection of mining fields in the north and center of Saudi Arabia to the Madin industrial complexes at both Ras Al Khair and Wadi Shaban industrial cities. complex, the largest in the Middle East, a 
four babies and the babies took the child from the two women and brought to her. But she refused the other woman to become a mother and to have children. The other the only one child that she had had to pay her was her her grief was so deep employees, indirect and, and direct employee, around 5,000 five, 5, uh, employees. However, for, for the total direct employees is around that number, which is around 2,300. And the Saudization has been improved over the years. Taking into consideration, the knowledge has been shared by our joint venture, which is Alcoa. And now we are in a good and better shape compared to the previous, alhamdulillah. Moving forward, we have mentioned earlier in the video that we have uh, a new system, which is the natural engineering uh, water treatment system that has been built in Ma'adan Aluminium. We have a zero discharge wastewater into the sea. We are processing our water inside our plant to make it usable for a process water and also for, for irrigation water. Moving forward, we know that the aluminum industry has a waste, which is the red mud, or we call it um, bauxite residue. We are committed to sustainability. When it came to the sustainability, we have to, to make sure that we can recycle the red mud. So we didn't stop into that level. We moved forward. We tried to, to explore and trying to neutralize the red mud with the phosphate gypsum that uh, available from the phosphate company in order to, to reach a level that could be beneficial for the kingdom and also for, for the company. So we already built a couple of testing bats within Ma'ad al-Aluminium that we used it for, for, for vegetation and also to, um, to ensure that we can grow some green field from that, uh, from that uh, waste. We successfully, alhamdulillah, did that. Moving forward, we try to, to expand it and move forward to make sure that this, could, this mix can be beneficial for the company and for the kingdom where we can use it and make sure that uh, it could grow some vegetation that could be used for, for example, um, vegetable, uh, fruits, etc. So this is the in development in study and we will try to make sure that it could be succeed and in the future and we can be, uh, it could be beneficial. Furthermore, we are trying to investigate and see how it could be value added uh, to, to convert that red mud into uh, a byproduct that could be beneficial for the civil industries, where it could be used for cement, could be used for uh, tiles. We could, so investigation is ongoing and we are moving forward following the, the, our ESG commitment. Achievement and accreditation. We have, over the past years, we achieved multiple certificates, alhamdulillah. Starting with aluminum stewardship uh, initiatives, which is the performance certification and chain of custody. Since we are committed to ESG, which is the environment and social and governance, ASI certificate, it's, it's uh, taken into consideration multiple uh, parameter and the criteria to achieve it, which is around 62, uh, 62 criteria, yes, 
sorry for this words. I just for, for, forget about it. And we are, alhamdulillah, successfully achieved that certificate. For what? We care about contractor supply chain. So we, we try hard to obtain our chain of custody. So in order to obtain it, alhamdulillah, we achieve it. Quality management system, uh, laboratory management system, business continuity management system, alhamdulillah, we are alhamdulillah, certified within Ma'ad al-Aluminium, and we are heading to that direction, trying to consolidate multiple certificates now across the organization in order to move forward. We, without our people, we are not able to achieve whatever we achieved, alhamdulillah. So we have multiple programs within Ma'ad al-Aluminium. We touch base, in addition to the inter internal development plan that, that's developed by Ma'adan, Within Ma'ad al-Aluminium, we have multiple programs that could be value added for our engineers. That start with a uh, lean Six Sigma program. It's distributed into two programs, Six Sigma, and also lean deployment to touch bases on Kaizen and touch base on TPM, uh, 5S, and waste elimination. Six Sigma, where most of you know that it's considered from yellow, green, black, and also master black built in order. and. We can see here, the program has started within Ma'ad al in 2018 by a consultant. And within one, team, one year time, our team in Ma'ad, they pick it up and they start developing uh, multiple projects in order to obtain some certificate and also based on a real project from the field to improve the process. And definitely any employee would like to be recognized by end of his project. So we have developed a reward and recognition system within the company that will help the employee to move forward and encourage him to do some more projects. Initially, the program is only set for specific engineer level in order to boost them and make them valuable to the company. However, we are trying to expand it to our new fresh engineers that joint Ma'adin. So we are encouraging them and taking them to, to that program in order to move forward with, uh, with, with, with his learning curve. Strategy. Let me touch base on, on the strategy in a very high level. There are a couple of highlights I would like to introduce now. Our aluminum production capacity need to be increased by 2.5x compared to whatever we are producing now is around 0.8 or 740,000 uh, metric ton. The, the, we need to also to increase our value added the product, not only only a primary. So that's need to be increased by 72%, which is currently about 55%. Recycling capacity, currently we are Less. However, in order to move with our ESG, we have to increase the, the, the recycling capacity and to make it more valuable to the country. The, the, government, has been, the, the government has introduced in 2021 by the Crown Prince, His Highness Mohammed bin Salman, that we need to reach to a net zero carbon or to, to reach to a level that the carbon will be neutralized. So we are committed to that, and we have set a target for us as a Ma'adan that we need, by, sorry, we need to be, in 2030, we need to reach to a 50%, and 2050 will be as a zero, compared to our competitor, which is Alcoa and our joint venture, Rio Tinto. And f moving forward, we are a better shape, alhamdulillah, compared to others, and we are heading to that direction. That direction. And that will not be done by us alone. So it will be by us, also by our, uh, by our stakeholders and our, our team within, within the organization. Within Ma'adin, we introduce, we have four pillars, which is leveraging the, the KSA resources, we have to deliver a value focus, a product, and we need to, uh, like, to be um, productive and also to, we need to focus on the ESG. So, in the coming years, we are planning to extend the current capacity of a smelter. Currently, we have around 740, 720 pots, uh, two lines of a smelter. We need to expand those and also build ad additional uh, smelter lines. 
and also increasing by by increasing the uh, the smelter capacity definitely we need more feed which should should come from refinery moving forward optimize the value added the product portfolio and increase the uh, value added the product Samabco is our shareholder. Uh, uh, Samabco is our joint venture. Uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, Samabco is our caustic uh, uh, provider that used by by our Maadir refinery to 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 uh, uh, the the caustic is used in in Maadir refinery company where we are in ha we are producing and removing the. Uh, the, the high content of silica and producing uh, producing the, the alumina. Caustic soda reduction is our, our 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 objective that we need to focus on, and also the alumina uh, and the alumina uh, volume need to be increased. ESG. ESG. When we talk about ESG, is 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 mainly to increase the recycling capacity plus using the, the renewable energy and also to minimize the bauxite waste by converting it to byproduct as mentioned earlier. So that will end up the presentation gentlemen. In case of any sort of questions please feel free to ask and I will, I, I'm happy to answer it. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation, uh, much valuable information. Uh, I had one question. You said that you intend to increase the lines of uh, smelting and processing uh, bauxite or alumina. Uh, if so, like, is the extraction of uh, bauxite already above capacity of the production of aluminum right now? And if so, when we increase the uh, number of production lines, do you intend to import bauxite to Saudi Arabia and further develop uh, or process it to aluminium and uh, uh, sell it to future markets outside of Saudi Arabia? Let me answer it in two parts. First of all, our bauxite reserve is a huge, alhamdulillah, within, within the kingdom. So there is no need, as per my understanding, to export more alumina in order to process it in, in our plants. So we, we are able to increase the production of our bauxite in al Ba'itha mine in order to produce the alumina and increase the production of alumina factory. So the process, if we uh, built an additional refinery, in our slide I mentioned that our refinery capacity has been increased, which is from 1.82, we are able to, do, like, able to uh, produce around 1.9 million currently. So we are above our nameplate capacity. So if we built additional refinery, we are going to, 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 to mine more in order to increase the alumina uh, production to be consumed in uh, the smelter. Yeah, so it will be internally, so there will be no sort of an export as per my understanding, but we need to investigate that and I have to check it with the team, definitely. Okay, and additional question if you would mind. Uh, all the alumina produced by Ma'adin, is it uh, provided in local markets or is any of it exported? Okay, good question. Whatever we produce, Maybe 70 to 75 percent is consumed within Ma'adan aluminium. The rest it will be sold export, so it's to the GCC countries and uh, and, to, and other uh, other refineries. So we are uh, selling and also consuming internally. But but the majority is consumed within Ma'adan aluminium. So that's the reason behind increasing production lines. You want to export further. Yeah, so it, it will be give and take, definitely. So we, it will be consumed in, in, in the additional uh, pots that we are planning to do mm -hmm. and the new project that we are planning to invest in. Uh, plus, it will be f for selling as well, so to, to increase the profit margin. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Yes. Uh, do you have a capacity of 328,000 tons of Yes. Uh, are you in a to support the local industry? Can uh, aluminum can industries for can body and can, uh, can ends and what is the volume that you are supplying to the local market? So we are supplying the majority to the local market for can body and can end stock. Uh, for the export it's purely uh, automotive uh, sheets that exported but the majority for can end and can body I believe it's currently export uh, internally uh, sold 
but I have to check on that for, for the sales uh, export and in, in like import the percentage uh, value. But the report that we get is totally opposite what you say. What is it? Uh, they say that uh, we are not getting the right support from Madan. Who? For the you know, uh, kind manufacturers, basically. They said uh, we don't get the right quantity of uh, aluminum construct. Due to, due to maybe and the production capacity could be. So what did you produce in 2021? What was it out of this uh, 378 install capacity? Uh, we, we, in 2021, we, we did some good, good job, to be honest. Let me can get, get, scan through it. I cannot go back. For can and, uh, it's, uh, in 2021, we are able to produce 290. That's can and, and auto compare again. It's, it's merge. So I, I didn't segregate it in, in my slide. But uh, in 2022, still, those are the budget numbers. It's not yet uh, finalized. So we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, release any information yet. But in terms of sales, uh, I cannot answer this question for the right time because it's not. Uh, it's not the right form. Yeah. No problem. Manufacture an exemption letter, because uh, normally if you want to um, get it from abroad, you you should pay taxes uh, on them or, and custom duties, because uh, there is a, a local manufacturer in there. But if you can't give them the quantity, why don't you agree to give them the letters on that? It's not a matter of quantity. We are supplying the local market with the aluminum can sheet. You are, but not yeah. to the to the uh, to the extent that they need. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we have uh, we have different cases that uh, they came to us and they said that we uh, Maadin could not give us uh, to. Uh, yeah to support. I have to return back, and if you allow me, I will get your contact, and they will see, and they will give you the right answer from the sales team because it's with the sales team. Yeah, think. and there is another question as well, and I need your justification mm -hmm. if you have it as well. Uh, regarding the cost structure, uh, sometimes we saw some contract. If you're selling a can and or can body outside of Saudi, the pricing per ton is much uh, much less than in Saudi. However, we're there to support localization. Uh, why is there a difference in price? Again, I don't have this, this answer for you, so it's a really difficult question to answer. I'm not, in, I'm not in a position to answer this question, to be honest, here, the time. Yes. I was in the sales of the for around 10 years in Ma'adin. Uh, we need to understand uh, one figure regarding the prices. We have three structures. We have uh, U.S. market, we have Europe market, and we have Japan market. So every market is uh, based on the nearest market for it. So when we talk about Saudi Arabia, the closest market is Japan. So our prices is considered uh, taken from Japan market. So that's why sometimes you see that the market price in Saudi Arabia is higher than the U.S. because there is, uh, uh, let's say, the, the demand in the U.S. is not that much. So the, the prices fall in the U.S. or in Europe. So we need to understand the structure of the market of the pricing uh, for us to understand why the prices in Saudi Arabia is higher than the U.S. or Europe, usually. MJP in the U.S., uh, in Saudi Arabia or in Asia, UAD in Europe and uh, uh, Midwest uh, in the U.S. So each one has their uh, own uh, structure of pricing depending on the supply and demand. So the premium is usually uh, moved uh, according to the supply and demand, not uh, a base price. To the LME. Uh, it depends. If it's ingot, it's LME plus the premium. If any other products, you need to add the upcharge above the ingot. So it's three components. Uh, I didn't have the answer for it, especially for the market. And yeah, China is a totally to different market. Yani. China has their own structure. The government supplies them, incentivizes them when they export. That's why the government had uh, put some uh, protection from these ch uh, cheap imports that are coming from Saudi Arabia.
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your good presentation. I have, um, I have a question here. Uh, you mentioned about automotive industry that you have a capacity of 80 tons uh, per year for the sheets. On the top of BMW and Jaguar Land Rover, do you supply other OEMs? Uh, that's my first question. The second one, with the arrival of, uh, of Seer and Lucid in the kingdom, what will be the expected capacity for the automotive sheets? Uh, from Mahadi. Okay, answering the first question, it's in the pipeline. So, uh, no information could be released at this, uh, this point of time. Uh, the second question, uh, there is a, the, the automotive sheet plant, it's able to, it's, it's capable to, 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 to produce more. So, it's just a matter of uh, supply and demand. Moreover, uh, rolling mill has been built as just in time. So, whenever we have a demand, we can produce. Other than that, we can, we can hold it. So whenever we, we receive a request to produce for a specific grade aluminum sheet, we are able to produce it. So that hopefully that answers your question. What will be the capacity by 2030, for example? Or oh, but by 2030? Yes. Uh, well, there is a figure number, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can reveal it for the time being, to be honest. But uh, yeah, we, ha we, have, we have plans to, to, to increase our production for rolling mill. Yes. Thank but you, sir. a lot of project. Thank you so much, Mr. Abdelaziz, for this insightful presentation. Now we will have a 10-minute break, and then we will come back for the uh, Ministry of Investment presentation. From the Ministry of Investment, we welcome Mr. Mohammed Maghribi, who is the Metal Segment Director for the Mining Metals Segment, MISA aim to facilitate, identify opportunities across the Vision 2030 plan and support local and international business through their investment journey to make investing in the kingdom as streamlined and simple as possible. Please welcome Mr. Mohammed. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank everyone attending this session, and I would like to give a special thank to SIDF to give me the opportunity to talk in one of the strategic and uh, one of the important metals that I love so much because I worked around 13 years in this industry. Uh, the team have, uh, as I, you can see from the audience, most of the team know about Saudi Arabia and about the Vision 2030 and why to invest in Saudi Arabia. So don't, I don't want to waste more time on these components. So let's jump straight away to the national investment strategy. When we talk about the national investment strategy, it falls on four main pillars, developing opportunities on the investors themselves about funding and also about the competitiveness and enabling. When we talk about the opportunities, usually we develop opportunities according to the current demand from strategic sector, for example, like the construction and oil and gas industry, but also we look into the future demand come from strategic sector as we talk now about the auto sector in Saudi Arabia, about the aerospace sector, and also from the defense sector. Uh, also what we do, we evaluate the value chains for strategic and important uh, products in Saudi Arabia and we develop opportunities among the whole value chain as I will show you in the metals and also in the aluminium value chain. When we talk about the investors, we enhance domestic, uh, domestic private sector and foreign investors uh, in parallel with the semi-government entities like PIF, like Dusser and other uh, government, uh, let's say, companies. And also we provide transparency to the private sector regarding the methodology and principles of partnership. Uh, when we talk about the funding in the strategy, we talk about introducing new financing products to diversify the financing uh, environment. Uh, and of course, the competitiveness and enabler, we make sure to visit the reforms, the regulations in Saudi Arabia to assure to put Saudi Arabia among the top performing uh, countries. Uh, this is the target that we want to achieve by 2030 uh, with the total or cumulative uh, total investments by 2030. We want to reach to 3.2 trillion US dollars uh, of investments by 2030, which means that we need to double the number of opportunities available currently in Saudi Arabia and also increase the foreign direct investment by 20 times. Okay, let's go straight away to the mining and metal sector in Saudi Arabia, which is the third pillar of the Saudi economy. 
uh, as emphasized by uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Vision 2030, I will quote his own words, our country is rich in its natural resources. We are not dependent solely on oil for our energy needs. Gold, phosphate, uranium, and many other valuable minerals are found beneath our lands. We talked, or uh, we didn't talk, but uh, because we passed quickly on why uh, Saudi, but when we talked about why to invest in Saudi Arabia, here we're talking about why to invest in Saudi Arabia in the mining and metal sector. We have five key reasons. First of all, the supply. As, you can, uh, as everyone knows, we have a supply of around 1.3 trillion US dollars on, uh, of, of minerals under the ground, not been tapped yet, which will open the door for mining companies to come and explore these opportunities to extract the minerals for, uh, to supply for the mid and downstream uh, businesses. Uh, when we talk about the demand in Saudi Arabia, we are the far, fourth largest net importer of metals, which shows that there are a lot of opportunities that can be localized uh, in Saudi Arabia in this sector. Of course, the competitive advantage of the availability and competitive tariffs for energy, natural gas, and, and the availability of infrastructure. And also, when we talk about the loans for this sector, according to the, how strategic this sector, and because of the location of some of these industries, loans can reach up to 75%. Uh, and of course, the location of Saudi Arabia between three continents. Uh, so the government has just recently announced uh, and approved the mining strategy aiming to create a new engine uh, beyond oil and gas and also to diversify the government revenue and create new jobs for Saudis and also develop uh, remote areas which is mainly focused in the mining sector. Uh, it's all about developing uh, remote areas. Currently, the contribution in, uh, uh, to the GDP from this sector is around 17 billion, mainly coming from the mid and downstream businesses. 15% is only for the mining, which shows that there is a lot of opportunities in the mining sector. We aim to increase it to 70 billion by 2030. Of course, we want to double the number of jobs in this sector and reduce the imports from 19 billion to 10 billion uh, US dollars, which shows by uh, reducing the imports, it means we need to create more opportunities in this sector. Okay, when we talk about the sector of mining and metal in, uh, in the Ministry of Investment, what we do exactly, we go and uh, 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 revisit all the value chains of all the strategic uh, metals in Saudi Arabia. For example, the steel, aluminum, copper, titanium, silicon, gold. And we see exactly what are the gaps available, what are the opportunities that we can develop. For example, uh, 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 for example the iron. We know that we have, a, 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 let's say, a good uh, midstream business producing crude steel, and there is a lot of opportunity in the downstream, but we are missing the extraction of iron ore due to the low content of FE, but there is a lot of investors currently say that they have the technology to extract this mineral and they can use it uh, for the production of steel. Of course, uh, currently we're also uh, evaluating to have a politization plan to supply the DRI, which is the most important raw material uh, for this industry. When we talk about the aluminum, which is our topic today, it's a full integrated facility by Ma'adin. Uh, we have, but we need to focus on the downstream opportunities. Ma'adin even in the past uh, developed 10 opportunities that is strategic for Saudi Arabia that we can talk about uh, in the coming slides. Of course, talking about the copper, we know there is a strong downstream business of the copper in Saudi Arabia, especially coming from the uh, energy sector or the power sector, but we are currently working to uh, localize a copper smelter in Saudi Arabia and also to uh, expand the uh, extraction of copper concentrate uh, in Saudi Arabia. So when we go and put the value chain of any metal, for example, this aluminum, because we'll talk about aluminum today, we evaluate it from the start of the mining process, from the upstream, until we reach to the final products, or let's say, to the final industries. Uh, not only opportunities in every stage, also we look into the raw material needed to produce one ton of uh, aluminum. We know how much liquid pitch is needed, how much uh, CBC is needed, calcium, petroleum, coke. So we, we also develop these opportunities and try to attract technical partners to come and evaluate these uh, opportunities in Saudi Arabia to make the project in Saudi Arabia more visible. And as you can see, as we go further in the value chain, the margins for the companies get higher and higher. That's why uh, just selling primary metal in Saudi Arabia or, ex or exporting it to the market, international market, it's like you're selling energy. You're not selling or you're not adding any value to the industry in Saudi Arabia. That's why we are focusing to develop uh, downstream businesses to supply the local market. Because when we talk about aluminum, we're not only talking about uh, producing aluminum, we're talking about 
producing or producing new uh, industry to Saudi Arabia, like the auto, aerospace. If you want to bring these industries, you need to uh, start and establish the copper, the titanium, the aluminium business in Saudi Arabia. So when we came to eva uh, evaluating the value chain of the aluminium, we came up or shortlisted the opportunities that we think are uh, attractive and important in Saudi Arabia. One is foils, aluminium foils, plates, which mainly used in the auto and aerospace, and also foundry alloy uh, ingots, and the casting wire rods, and also the coated sheet, and uh, aluminium composite uh, uh, panels also. These are the most strategic opportunities that we uh, developed uh, and identified to be promoted to the investors. And what we do exactly, we have, uh, let's say, uh, semi-deep semi dive uh, studies on these opportunities. I can share it with anyone who is interested. So what we do exactly, we take the opportunity like FOIL, we know the application, what is the technology needed, what is the major feedstock, and what is the product mix, and who are your end customers. Uh, and as you can see, يعني, the majority of these uh, uh, opportunities, the raw material is available in Saudi Arabia. For example, foundry alloy ingots, which is huge, usually used in the auto sector, Ma'adin can supply uh, straightaway liquid or aluminum ingots to anyone to produce foundry alloys. When we talk about the place, okay, we need some more investment in Ma'adin to produce it, but uh, we can just add a li like a line just to produce it in Saudi Arabia. When you talk about foils, also the uh, investor can uh, purchase from Ma'adin molten or ingots, and they can produce foil stock, which goes to the foil and the packaging and pharma industries. When we talk about wheels and casting, also it goes to the auto sector, and Ma'adin also can supply uh, ingots or molten metal for this industry or foundry alloys. Same thing goes to wire rod and also to the coated sheets. So as you can see from these opportunities, uh, first of all, we're developing new industries in Saudi Arabia, uh, supplying strategic sectors, and also the availability of raw material in Saudi Arabia, instead of just uh, exporting uh, energy to the, to, to the rest of the world. So thank you very much, because this will only talk about the role uh, of MISA in Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, Sam Mohammed. The opportunities are there. I mean, I'm talking English, so my colleagues understand me. So, uh, do you promote the uh, the metals based on the opportunities of uh, what is currently available in Saudi Arabia? Do you direct the, for example, the investors or maybe the foreign investors or the, or the lo local investors to the? Uh, what the kingdom is uh, looking for to develop more, or what's what's the the direction that you are taking right now? Yeah, when we look about the opportunities, first of all, we look at the uh, yeah, in the critical or the main uh, metals available in Saudi Arabia. For example, the, like the copper, the aluminium, the steel, and titanium and silicon. These are available, so we develop opportunities. But also, what we do, we look in the, to the future. Like for example, the batteries. We need to secure also cobalt, lithium for this industry. We don't have the raw material, so what we are promoting also is for businessmen in Saudi Arabia or big companies to go and explore mines outside Saudi Arabia to secure these raw materials in Saudi Arabia. Then we can develop opportunities uh, in, in these industries also. Thank you so much for this nice presentation. My question to you, you showed us a lot of investment opportunities in the kingdom where we have the local demand and Ma'adin can supply the raw material. So will Ma'adin give some sort of discounts for a company who will enter Saudi market to set up this type of line? Okay, thank you really, uh, very much for this question. Uh, I always get the same question from investors and I'd like to answer it always the same way. We as a government, we can't interfere in Ma'adin pricing. The, 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 the only thing that me as a government entity can do for Ma'adin is to secure investors or customers for them, and I can secure a meeting for them. That's the most uh, thing I can do for an investor or for Ma'adin. Uh, talking about the commercial terms, payment terms, uh, the pricing, uh, the government cannot interfere in any kind uh, of discussion in this field. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your uh, good presentation. Um, I want to go a little bit outside of aluminium, uh, but speaking about steel. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, the automotive industry and other industry are growing in the kingdom. 
and there is a need to have a metal sheet for automotive. Um, I heard that the, our Ministry of uh, Industry announced that there is some talks uh, that there will be a plan to produce the uh, sheets for automotive. Can you give us any more information? Because we just accept this uh, small news, we have nothing. Yeah, uh, currently what we are doing, we have, uh, everyone heard about three companies that come and produce cars in Saudi Arabia. So currently at this time, we are developing these opportunities with the alignment of these companies. So until today, honestly speaking, we didn't get the clear demand from Lucid or let's say Velocity or uh, the new company also, what are the products that you will need? From our understanding, when we talked, uh, just an example, when we talked about the EV, we thought that aluminum is the major component in these uh, cars, but it wasn't, it was steel. So until today, even when we meet Lucid and like that, the final, let's say, demand needed for every car, we, we didn't receive it yet. But of course, we are going to develop all of these uh, opportunities after we align with the, with the investors themselves. Thank you. Sorry, one more question related to same investments. Mr. Riyad, turn it on, please. Like if you remember uh, 10, 15 years back, uh, Land Rover and Jaguar, they decided to set up their uh, facility here to manufacture the cars because they said they will get some attractive discount on the aluminum, so which ultimately didn't happen, so they didn't come. So you mentioned in a previous answer also that we will not interfere, government will not interfere, then how this industry will develop? If you go back to petrochemicals, government gave a 40-year discount of very much subsidized ethane prices. That led to a massive industry here for petrochemicals. So then how you expect people will come and set up their plants here? Okay, uh, when we talk about petro petrochemical sector, how many years have it been uh, in the market? Can you let me? Okay, Maadin just started recently, the last 10 years. So we need to, yeah, and when we look at a company, we shouldn't say, uh, look at Bahrain, look at EGA, for example. These have been in the market since 35 years. You can't compare a company that has been in the business for 35 years and come to a company that just started and ask them to provide incentives or to provide discounts on their products. Uh, there is a total different uh, uh, comparison between these two industries. Petrochemical is a very old industry. Yeah, and we're talking now that the mining of metal just been approved by the government just in 2018 to be the third pillar of the Saudi economy. That's why the government is putting a lot of efforts, uh, having, uh, uh, let's say, advanced discussion with Ma'adin and other co uh, companies how to develop this sector in Saudi Arabia. But we are, let's say we're still uh, young enough uh, not to give these incentives at this moment. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed. This marks the last event in Knowledge Month and does not mean that it is the end of knowledge sharing opportunity. I'd like to thank all our speakers, attendees, for today's insightful and high impact presentations. Our hope that this has provided the Saudi ecosystem with a greater understanding of aluminium value chain. If you have any further uh, queries, questions, or clarification, please feel free to reach out and we will be very happy to communicate further. And now I would like to welcome our Vice President, Engineer Ahmed Al Bagawi, to give the trophy for our participants. So we would like to welcome Ms. Zain uh, to receive CRU trophy on their behalf. And now, uh, Mr. Abdelaziz Dbeib. Now, Mr. Mohammed Maghribi.
Thank you so much, everybody.